Yeah. Remember to record. Yes, recording. Excellent. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. On behalf of SMZ Healthcare and Patients Australia, we would like to welcome you to another information evening on managing headaches and migraines. From Ramsey Healthcare, I'm Sherry Hill, and I'm joined tonight by my colleague Kerry Liu. From Pain Specialist Australia, we've got Dr. 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 Crystal Lewis and Dr. Rajiv Hala. Ramsey Healthcare is an Australian owned private healthcare organisation since 1964. Currently, we are the largest private healthcare organisation and we also operate globally across 11 different countries. Ramsey Healthcare offers a range of primary and acute services. In Victoria alone, we have 13 surgical hospitals, two rehabilitation hospitals, one anesthesia centre and one mental health facility. Pain Australia currently operates two hospitals, Warringal Private Hospital in Heidelberg and the Avenue Hospital in Windsor. Before we get started, I could go through some housekeeping. Tonight's session will run for approximately one hour with a combination of a presentation and some discussion. We will also be running a couple of anonymous polls just to help us understand who you are and tailor this presentation and discussion to your needs. Tonight is a really great opportunity for you to ask any questions to our specialists on managing headaches, migraines, or any general questions regarding pain. All you have to do is click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer your question either verbally or via the chat. Without further ado, I hand the session over to Dr. Nick Chrysalis. Thanks very much, Sharon. Thanks very much, everyone. I just wanted to make sure you can all hear me okay, because you were a bit stuttered there for a few seconds, Sharon. It's all good, all clear? Good. Okay. So as you know, my name is Nick Chrysalis. I'm a pain management specialist. Um, uh, I also have a colleague of mine in attendance, Dr. Rajiv Chawla, who is uh, another pain specialist, and we'll get Rajiv to jump in and help out with some questions uh, as we go along. Um, today's a big topic. We've got about an hour, and um, headaches is uh, a huge topic, so I'm going to jump in. I want to touch on a lot of topics uh, so that I can uh, give something to everyone, um, so well, probably about 40, 40 minutes or so, give or take, and then lots of time for questions and answers. So let's jump in. Um, I don't have any disclosures. I don't work for any med tech or pharma companies. Um, and basically the practice was born on one belief and that is no one should suffer from pain. So that belief led to our purpose, our vision. And as you can see, that's in front of you. Um, and uh, we're pleased to say that this practice has grown from strength to strength over the last uh, almost 10 years. Um, effectively, there are many ways to control pain. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So to actually dial down uh, the, the nature of pain, the severity of pain. But that's not the only way to manage pain. Managing pain takes a team. It takes a team of allied health professionals, a team of rehab professionals, uh, teams of different hospitals to manage uh, not only the pain, but the person with the pain and the family uh, uh, that suffers from the pain as well. So this is what a good pain management approach might look like. And I'm sure some of you have seen this before. We start off with steps. And the first step is to get somebody healthy. Um, I'll just take that back. The first step is to get somebody uh, healthy. The first step is to get somebody uh, off the, the wrong medications, focus on preventative uh, medicine and well-being. If that's not effective, then we can always step up to step two, because where we use diagnostic uh, injections and sometimes treatment injections. So injections to understand and treat the pain severity. And then moving on to more advanced treatments like nerve stimulation, which are what we call um, advanced pain therapies. But the basis is always good rehabilitation, whether it be functional, physical, or psychological rehabilitation, because pain is exhausting. Nick, sorry, we can't see any slides. Oh, I've shared the screen. Um, it all looks like it's shared. Let's try again. 
should have jumped on a bit earlier. Okay, how does that look? Better, okay. can see it now. So that's the approach that I was just talking about. Um, steps one, two, and three with the foundation of good um, rehabilitation. And I would have shown people this slide before. Uh, we're going to put up the poll while I talk you through this. And this is when to see a pain specialist. A lot of people think that if you've got high levels of distress or anxiety, you should see a pain specialist. But actually, pain specialists are trained to, to, to diagnose and treat many specific pain conditions, as you can see up on the top of the slide. Um, we're also very good at managing medications to help pain if the simple medications are not helpful. And because most of us are anaesthetists, we are very good at helping people in the perioperative period. So if you're having surgery or recovering from surgery, it can be very helpful in terms of getting you through that process uh, safely. Um, as you can see, one of the pain conditions we do treat is headaches and facial pain. Uh, it's a big part of what we do. And one of the things we note is when people have pain in their head or their face, it's quite hard to get away from that pain, say, for example, if the pain was in your foot. Uh, and so it does cause a lot of anxiety, a lot of distress. So we have to treat the whole person uh, and not just the pain itself. Uh, we have clinics in Richmond, Heidelberg and Waverley, and we're proud to say that um, we aim to see, uh, we, we, we see up to 85% of our patients refer to us within the first 30 days. And depending on the severity, we can see people within a week or two, depending on uh, their pain condition. So let's dive in. Chronic pain. That's what we're talking about here. Headaches are not just migraines, but we're talking about chronic pain. Um, and pain is something that persists, or chronic is something where it persists for more than three months. It's a leading cause of complaint. It causes um, distress. It interferes with function and, you're, and, and it causes suffering. So it's not just the pain, but it's the effects of pain that are so important. And that's what some headaches and migraines can be. Um, there's a book called the ICD-11 International Classification of Diseases. And for the first time ever, chronic pain is its own disease. So it's not a symptom, but it's an actual uh, disease itself. And there are many types of chronic pain, which have now been classified. And relating to the discussion tonight, as you can see on the left, chronic primary pain, halfway down, chronic primary headaches or oral fa orofacial pain is a now a defined pain condition. And there are many other causes on the, on the right-hand side where you can see there are other triggers, so what we call secondary pain conditions. In other words, that's pain triggered by uh, the neck, um, uh, tumors, and other medical conditions. Um, and if we take chronic primary headaches and orofacial pain, that can be subclassified into many other uh, causes or many other pain conditions, which I'm going to touch on in a little while. I'm not going to go on to that and not on to that. So this slide is there to, to remind you, and as I'm sure many know, the head is a very complex structure. Not only do we have delicate nerves and blood vessels, but we have muscles, we have um, you know, part, of the, part of the larynx, part of the esophagus, um, eyes, nose, so, and of course the, the skull that houses the brain. So it's a very complex area, and it's not surprising that there are many causes of headaches and facial pain. There is a book that's about 700 pages, I think, um, or thereabouts called the IHS classification of headaches. Um, and there are three groups. There is the primary headaches. In other words, headaches is the main problem. And then there are secondary headaches. And that's where headaches are caused by other medical conditions. And then the third category or the third area is that called neuropathies and facial pain. So not headaches per se, but pain in the front of the, the head or the face. And there are many, many different causes. This is a great diagram that was drawn in, I think, the early 1800s by uh, George Cruikshank from London. He was a cartoonist. And uh, as you can see, this is early descriptions of people with headaches and facial pains. So that's what I want to touch on. Migraines, tension type headaches, uh, so-called trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, briefly on the TMJ, burning mouth syndrome and oral facial pain, uh, trigeminal neuralgia, 
uh, and then secondary headaches. And the main two are cervicogenic, where they come from the neck, and medication overuse headaches, uh, which is a big cause of headaches as well. So taking too many medications. As any good physician, whether you be a neurologist or a pain specialist, you need to make a diagnosis. You need to make sure there's nothing serious happening like tumors and various other um, significant medical conditions. Uh, the approach involves education, recognizing triggers, weaning opioids, which is a discussion in itself, and then making the diagnosis. Once you've got a diagnosis, you use combination therapy. And like, every, and, and like everyone we see, um, we need to individualize treatment because every single person is different. I've never seen two migraines that are similar. Um, they're always different because they occur in different people. So let's jump into migraines. It's one of the most debilitating conditions on this planet, according to the WHO. Uh, it affects women more so than men. And 80% of migraines occur without an aura. Um, and effectively, what migraines is, is a con it's a neurological condition that can take hours or days to occur uh, or, or happen. So there's a prodrome, as you can see, which is the early features of migraine. People know they're getting migraine. Then there's the aura, which only occurs in about 20% of people. Then the headache itself. And then the postdrome or the, the after effects the recovery phase per se. And every, um, every migraine can have different components. But one thing that we do see commonly is the, the characteristics of the migraine. It's normally one-sided. It's normally pulsatile. It's normally severe. So that's one of the characteristics of a migraine. And it stops you from doing things. So you've got to lie down. And there's sometimes nausea and um, photophobia. So, so light can hurt as well. But it's a severe condition. Um, these are the medical managements of migraines. And the green areas are what the neurologist will probably work you through uh, uh, repeatedly. So various medications um, and, and preventative therapies to try and reduce the severity or, or the frequency of the migraine occurring. So these include medications like antidepressants, medications like antihypertensives. And of course, there are new medications called CGRP antagonists, which are injections being uh, trialed by a number of neurologists, which can be very helpful. But the area that are not green, those are the areas where pain specialists might come in to, uh, might come in to help. Uh, we can get people off or down opioids, and we know that opioids can sometimes trigger a migraine. And I know there are many of you out there that'll say, I use my opioids to help because it's the only thing that works. And the answer is yes, but also it might be causing a bit of a loop of your pain. Um, being interventional pain specialists, we can use nerve blocks to try and diagnose and try and treat the migraines, which I'll touch on in a second. So we can use um, uh, ultimately things to control the symptoms. So we can't cure the migraine, but we can control this frequency and severity of the headaches. So occipital nerve blocks, this area below the, below the skull, which is called the occipital space or the suboccipital space is quite a rich area with nerves and blood vessels that we can focus on. And of course, nerve stimulation. But let's move on to acute migraines. So sometimes we can do a block on, an, on a, um, an, a, a group of nerves just halfway into the nose called a sphenopalatine ganglion. And we can do a block with a pledget in the back of the nose. And that can sometimes help the severity of a migraine attack. We can do great occipital nerve blocks, the back of the head, which can be helpful. And of course, as you can see on the slide, uh, we can do some craniofacial blocks, so blocks on the nerves around the face, again, to reduce the severity of the migraine itself. So sometimes if we can catch a migraine, uh, we can help uh, uh, stop it. Uh, and then the, which I've done, and then the prophylactic treatments, as I said, you can see the back of the skull, uh, just below the skull, there's a rich area of muscles and nerves, and you can see muscles with the nerves in it. And when you're in pain, muscles contract, and when muscles contract, they grab nerves. Uh, so we can focus needle, um, needle therapies in that area under a little bit of sedation, where we can desensitize some of those nerves, and that can be very helpful. Uh, 
Um, so that's called pulsed radio frequency of the greater occipital nerves. Uh, the suboccipital space is a space just below that uh, where we can focus some treatment as well. So we can pulse the nerves, we can, we can open up the, uh, the layers between the muscles and free up some trapped nerves. So um, uh, there are some other things we can do in that area to treat the severity of migraines. There are two uh, relatively new therapies out there. One is called the uh, Kephali, kef which is a supraorbital nerve stimulator. It provides electrical current on this nerve to help uh, prevent migraines. And now available in Australia, the Gamma Core, which is a, um, a vagal nerve stimulator, which is a device you apply to the to the neck two or three times a day. And that has also early studies have shown that that can be helpful in preventing migraines a very low risk treatment, so definitely something to consider. And that's just arrived on Australian shores. Nerve stimulation is something we can use. So pacemakers, where we apply little electrodes over the nerves, and you can see the nerves on the back of the head. We can apply uh, uh, electrical nerve stimulation to these nerves, which is not outside the body, this is inside the body, but it can absolutely be used for some severe cases of migraine. Tension type headaches, let's move on. So this is a different type of a headache to a migraine. It's normally on both sides. It's a milder headache. It's a pressing or tightening around the head. Um, it's not really worsened with exertion, it's just there. And there's none of that severity of migraines. There's no eye pain or photophobia, and there's no general nausea. Now a tension type headache, can generally be caused by trigger points in muscles. And as you can see, there are many muscles around the area. And I'll just pick a muscle. Um, the, I'll just go back, I'll pick a muscle. Let's pick the semispinalis capitis, which is a muscle right in the back of the head here. And that's this diagram there. And if you've got a, a, a trigger point in that muscle, you can get pain all the way up and over your head. But you can't diagnose that until you examine the muscles and you find the muscle, you feel the muscle, you push the muscle and it triggers the pain. So there's a whole area that we should be examining to look for these trigger points, which can sometimes be used uh, to, to focus treatment on to treat tension type headaches. So this is the way you might manage a tension type headache. Uh, so the green area is what we might be able to do. We could do nerve blocks, uh, but mainly we do muscle and, um, muscle and tendon blocks with either some local anesthetic or some PRP, so platelet-rich plasma, which can be very helpful. And then, of course, we can focus on those little areas uh, um, where there are nerves, relax the nerve, relax the muscle, sometimes treat the symptom of tension-type headache. Cluster headaches. Um, that's a really good diagram to describe cluster headaches. Um, absolutely debilitating. I think it's called a suicide headache, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it's severe, it's one-sided, it's involved with the eye. Uh, it can happen for uh, seconds or days or anything in between. And they come in clusters that can sometimes last for weeks. Um, and it's associated with swelling, uh, watering eye. And again, it's a unique type of headache, uh, which is incredibly severe. Uh, you'll be managed by neurologists and they generally get cluster headaches under control. But again, we can sometimes focus nerve blocks uh, to treat cluster headaches. And I've got a uh, a gentleman who I've seen uh, once a couple of years ago, and we performed two blocks on him in the clinic. We did the great occipital nerve block and a sphenopalatine block, and it completely stopped his cluster, his clusters of headaches. Um, and there are some other areas we can focus treatment on as well. So you've got to make a diagnosis before you can focus treatment. Orofacial pain is a group, a big group of people we see, uh, and that's pain on the front of the face, uh, not, on the, not on the back generally. And that can be uh, muscle and joint. The temporomandibular joint is a, is a big area. And one of the big pain, pains is, of course, trigeminal neuralgia, which is above the eye, below the eye, or below the mouth. And if pain occurs in the neck region, that might be called glossopharyngeal neuralgia, which is a nerve uh, just below the jaw. 
Uh, and then of course we see quite a lot of mouth uh, pain conditions as well. One of them called burning mouth syndrome, which I'll come to. So trigeminal neuralgia, I know there are a lot of people out there with trigeminal neuralgia, uh, but not all trigeminal neuralgia is trigeminal neuralgia. There's the classic trigeminal neuralgia where people walk down the road and then drop and they get up and walk along. So it happens for seconds. It's very short lived. It's very severe. Uh, but then there's other long, uh, longer lasting pain within the trigeminal area, and those are called trigeminal neuropathies. Um, and there are many causes of trigeminal neuropathy, and that's not always trigeminal neuralgia. There are many medications that can be trialed, um, such as carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, and some other muscle relaxants. Um, Sometimes neurosurgeons or neurologists focus at certain treatments, such as um, uh, what we call a microvascular decompression, which is where a neurosurgeon decompresses the nerve deep in the brain. And that can be helpful for classic trigeminal neuralgia, but it's not always helpful for um, secondary trigeminal neuralgia, trigeminal neuralgia caused by other causes. Uh, so again, it's very important to make the correct diagnosis. This is the way a pain specialist might um, treat uh, the symptoms of trigeminal neuralgia. If it's mainly focused on this area, we could focus some treatment on the nerves above the eye. If it's mainly focused on this area, we can focus some treatment on what we call the V2 nerve, the sphenopalatine ganglion nerve. And then V3 would be the mandibular nerve. So we can block or pulse with a needle those nerves. You can see the picture on the left. Um, this person had a traumatic eye injury or orbit injury. And you can see all these little pins that have pinned uh, clearly a, a big fracture that they've had. And then on the right hand side, you can see these little electrodes, these little wires that, that have been placed above and below the eye, again, to treat uh, pain around the eye. So that can be very helpful for severe cases of um, uh, traumatic trigeminal neuralgia or facial pain. The TMJ, um, a lot of people uh, see uh, oral uh, surgeons um, and um, may get pointed to the TMJ. In other words, the joint is the problem. But I just remind you that the joint is one small factor in this area around your pain, uh, around your face. Um, the joint is surrounded by muscles and tendons and nerves. So sometimes you may have had a problem with the joint that's triggered the pain, that might have healed, and now you're left with broad pain in the area. Might not be a TMJ pain, but it might be a neuropathic a nerve pain around the area. So that's a very important. And there have been some studies now looking at PRP injections, so platelet-rich plasma injections, into and around the muscles in this area, particularly the masseter muscles. So the masseter muscles, number two on the picture. Um, and that can be very helpful in, in, in uh, dialing down the severity of symptoms with TMJ uh, pain. And a lot of studies, a lot of pain studies have shown that TMJ disorders are actually chronic pain conditions. So you may not require a surgery and intervention. Sometimes people even get the, the jaw uh, joint replaced with a, with a moderately big surgery. So you might not need that because this is a neuropathic, a chronic pain condition. So if you're in that realm of TMJ pain, you might need, you might need to consider whether a pain specialist can give you some, uh, an opinion and some treatment options to help that pain. Uh, burning mouth syndrome. Um, incredibly distressing syndrome to have you can't you can't get away from sensation within your mouth it's a daily deep burning within the mouth it's been there for about six months it increases as the day goes on so that can sometimes happen with neuropathic pain it kind of gets worse as time goes on um, there may then uh, it says symptoms are not or sometimes there may be improvement with ingestion of food so when they eat helps a little bit Generally, patients can sleep well, although we see a lot of patients that are interfered with or their, their sleep is interfered with by their pain. And there are a whole bunch of sensory problems as well. Uh, sometimes we can focus some injections on the lingual nerve, the tongue nerve, depending on where the symptoms are. And we recently had a lady with burning tongue syndrome as opposed to burning mouth syndrome. And we were able to control the symptoms with, um, 
with some injections onto the, the nerves of the tongue. Uh, cervicogenic headaches. So I'm just checking the time. So cervicogenic headaches are headaches, and we see a lot of these where the headaches trigger, um, sorry, the headaches are triggered by a pain within the joints around the neck. So if you have a look on the diagram here on the left, you can see the joints. They are called facet joints. There are nerves right next to the facet joints. So when the joints get inflamed and swollen, they trigger the nerves and you can see the nerves run up and over around the head. So cervicogenic headaches can uh, display themselves in a wide, broad area around the back of the head, all the way up to uh, the, 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 the top of the head, all the way down to below the, the scapula, below the shoulder blade. That can be neck pain. And of course, have a look at the diagram on the right hand side that can sometimes refer around to the front of the ear and the back of the eye. So that's cervicogenic headaches. But if you if you have got somebody that hasn't examined that area, they're not going to be able to um, to make a diagnosis and apply the appropriate treatment. I'm coming to the end of the slide. So I wanted to get through things in roughly about 30 minutes. I wanted to give lots of time for questions and answers. I wanted to bring Rajiv in, into the discussion as well and get his uh, expertise on this topic. Um, but let's talk about medication overuse headaches. This is a difficult discussion we have with a lot of our patients because uh, in some instances, medications can help. But then when you get to a point where you're taking quite a lot of medications, you find that the medications actually cause a bit of a neurological loop and they actually trigger pain. So you stop the meds, you get a withdrawal, you get pain, you take the meds, the pain goes away and you get into this vicious cycle where the medications become the problem. So this is, the di this is how you diagnose medication overuse headaches. They need to fill three criteria. One, Headaches on more than 15 days a month in somebody with a pre-existing headache disorder. Two, regular overuse of acute or symptomatic headache drugs for more than three months. And this can either be what we call agotamines or triptans. Opioids are there. So you're having these medications for more than 10 days in a month. And sometimes it's even the simple analgesics, which is paracetamol and anti-inflammatories, <coughs> Uh, for more than about two weeks in a month, so 15 days in a month, or any combination of these medications for more than 10 days in a month. And also, you need to have another uh, diagnostic criteria, which is the headache cannot be caused by anything else, or there's no other real cause for the headache. So more than 15 days a month, and you're taking medications for more than 10 days a month or 15 days in that month, and there is no other cause for the headache. That's a medication overuse headache. How do you treat medication overuse headaches? Well, you get rid of the medication, which is sometimes easier said than done. But the aim really is to withdraw medication. Sometimes you replace those medications with other medications to help treat the withdrawal. Um, get through the first and worst part of the um, uh, the withdrawal process. And then you can use preventative therapies like beta blockers, Velproate, Topamax, uh, Amitriptyline, and a few others. But the key with medication overuse headaches is you've got to look back after two or three months of having stopped the medication. So you've got to wait a number of months to actually see how much you've improved by. It doesn't happen over days or weeks. So medication overuse headaches. Um, so in summary, and I'm happy to jump back onto the slides that are relevant or where the questions direct us and elaborate on, on whatever's relevant to you. Um, headaches and facial pain are very, very complex. Neurologists manage a lot of them. Um, uh, maxillofacial uh, or oral specialists manage a lot of them. But, uh, but if they're chronic and if they're, and if they're causing some form of debility or suffering, then a pain specialist should provide an opinion as well, because we do have some strategies, we do have some therapies that we can apply to help control the symptoms. Um, so again, I'm going to just leave the slide up for a, for a few moments. Um, 
there are many pain conditions that pain specialists can be uh, called on to help. And again, headaches and facial pain is absolutely one of them. Uh, we can help tidy up medications. We can help rationalize opioids. We can use non-opioid therapies. And if we've made an appropriate diagnosis, of which there are many, then we can focus interventional therapies on those diagnoses to help reduce the pain symptom, to help provide and allow the rehabilitation to occur. Um, and as you, most of you, I'm sure know, pain management is a two-way street. Um, there is no quick fix that can happen. It's about us helping control symptoms while we can get people back on track again using, using other teams and allied health uh, professionals. So I'm going to stop the presentation, but the, um, the discussion has not stopped. Um, I want to uh, open things up to questions. Um, so I'll maybe uh, allow Rajiv to jump on. And um, if he's got anything he really wants to get answered or really wants us to discuss, then um, uh, let me know, Rajiv. Just unmute yourself. Just unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Uh, sorry, uh, there is a question about use of uh, Kefali and Gamma Core uh, and uh, the use of these for managing cluster headaches and, uh, and migraine, especially. Uh, I do not have the experience of using these in my practice yet. This is new to me. So I wonder if you can share your experience, please. Sure. I haven't got experience with Kefali, but the similar thing applies. They're both focused on different nerves. So Kefali, this, the above the, the forehead, which makes sense because a lot of headaches and migraines occur in that area. And um, the gamma core, the vagal nerve stimulator. And there have been some really good studies looking at vagal nerve stimulation uh, to control various forms of inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. And now early studies have shown that um, the gamma core can be helpful in, uh, in preventing severity frequency of migraines. Like most of the stuff we do, we do in medicine, there are not phenomenal studies out there, but there's certainly enough studies to guide us. Now, the thing about the, the gamma core is there are, there are very few risks, if any. Um, there is nothing applied under the skin. There is no injection. So if you have an injection, there's a risk of um, bleeding and infection at the very least. Um, if we apply nerve stimulation under the skin, there comes additional risks. Um, but whereas this is called non-invasive nerve stimulation, so it, it absolutely could be considered if things are not um, uh, getting treated with conventional therapies. Now, one of the things we're working on is how to make the gamma core accessible to most. Um, the Gamma Core, there, are, there is a website out there that you can go to. Um, I think what you do currently as it stands is um, there is, I think you can uh, get the device and the cost is to unlock the device to use it for a period of a trial, which might be two to three months. I'm not sure on the exact cost, but it, it, it'll amount to hundreds of dollars. So that might be the only thing really is to, to, to um, to trial this therapy for two or three months for a number of hundreds of dollars to see if this is an effective therapy. And it might be one of those things that you can add on to. But I look forward to using it in the relevant patients so that we can, we can get some understanding and get some experience on it. Uh, thank you, Nick. There has been a question. Uh, if there is a drug resistant uh, uh, cluster headache, what's the uh, next port of call, especially for prophylaxis? Yeah, good question. So um, I'll bring up the, um, I'll bring up that slide again. Um, so I'll just briefly share my screen. As I said, we don't see a lot of people with cluster headaches purely because of the fact that the neurologists generally manage cluster headaches fairly well. Um, so they use triptans and oxygen therapy. You should be able to see that screen. Um, Verapamil, topiramate, steroids, and lithium are the big ones to prevent cluster headaches. But as an interventional pain specialist, if we can see somebody when the clusters are starting, 
or when somebody uh, knows that the clusters are happening, we can bring you into the clinic and we can do this stuff just in the clinic. So you don't even need to come into a hospital. These blocks can be done very safely, very effectively. And I, as I said, the last chap I treated, we did a great occipital nerve block um, and that wasn't enough to break the cluster. So he came back a couple of weeks later and we did a great occipital nerve block again, but combined it with a sphenopalatine block, which is a block with a, you basically stick a, a cotton bud into the nose with some anesthetic and that seeps through an area onto the sphenopalatine ganglion and you can see that on this part of the picture and um and that the, com the combination of those two treatments um broke the cluster uh, and so it's very safe very simple can be done in a clinic as an outpatient can be very helpful to break clusters what are your what's your experience with clusters rajiv I think, uh, as you said, mainly treated with neurologists, and by the time they used to come to uh, a pain clinician, it was more towards uh, injection therapy. And with the recent evidence of neuromodulation, uh, we would also consider uh, occipital nerve stimulation as well. That was kind of, I was in a specialist center with neurologists, and then they used to throw kitchen sink uh, with the tablets full beforehand. So mainly injections and neuromodulation at the end. Yeah, so the, so the answer is really, if you're stuck with medications and you can't get control of the clusters, I think two things. One is we've got to make sure it's a cluster headache because it might be something else, but the likelihood is it's clusters because they're quite specific diagnoses. And the other is reach out to a pain physician or pain clinic so that we can consider simple injections to, to help um, um, stop the cluster. What other questions do we have? Uh, I'm just reading uh, through them, Nick. Uh... So I've got somebody, um, Helen, who said, my son had both of the occipital nerve block and this phenopalatine block without success. Um, I wonder if the next step might be neuromodulation. So one of the things we do as pain specialists is always come back to, is the diagnosis correct? And I'm not saying it's not correct, but it's something always to question. Do we have the right diagnosis? Is there the right cause of pain? Um, and if so, yes, and simple injections are not uh, effective, then you would move from step one to step two, which is the injections. If that's not effective, move on to step three, even consider whether nerve, nerve stimulation might be effective, which is what Rajiv was alluding to. And that's placing of electrical wires, little uh, pacemaker wires, over the occipital nerves, which we can trial temporarily to see if that's enough to break these um, to, 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 to break these cycles of pain. There's a question, how long do nerve blocks last? It's a really good question and there's no real answer for it. Um, I've had some people where nerve blocks have lasted six to eight months. Um, I've got a couple of people where they've lasted a year or two. On the whole, they might last uh, from days to months or weeks to months. Uh, but I certainly have seen quite a lot of people where we see them in the clinic once or twice a year, just top them up with a couple of nerve blocks and things are settled. It doesn't happen with everyone though. And as I said, that's why pain management is a, it's, it's fluid, it's, it's moving, it's always reassessing and re-examining. Um, re Nick, there's been a few questions around um, referring to yourself and Pain Specialist Australia. So just wondering what's the best way for the patients to book in with yourself or Rajiv? Good question. Um, so we require a, a referral from a medical practitioner, whether it be a GP or a specialist, and that's to allow the Medicare rebate for patients. Um, first appointment is... Um, you're out of pocket about $200 or so. Don't quote me on that, give or take. Um, then there's a rebate of about um, $150, $160. Um, we see people quickly, so we don't like pe getting people uh, waiting. In the public sector, you might wait six to 12 months. We will see 80% of people within 30 days of a referral, depending on the severity. If we knew it was a cluster headache and it was a you know an active cluster, then we'd get you in to see somebody like Rajiv within a week, uh, or, you know, within days. Um, uh, on our website, Pain Specialist Australia, there's the contact area and everything is there that you need. So it's a um, it's a pretty straightforward process, and most GPs or specialists would be happy to um, to provide you with a referral. Uh 
there are a few questions regarding long-term migraine sufferers and drug overuse headache. Now, with all due respect, I think I'm, I'm uh, mentioning Sophie, Jody here. Uh, life does not come in black and white. So yes, you may have been diagnosed with one pain at one stage uh, in your pain journey, but I would like to say that uh, my experience suggests a lot of uh, things overlap, that it's not only that you had migraine, then you would only have migraine. You also may have some uh, uh, cervicogenic headache on top of it, central sensitization on top of it. So it's very difficult to advise you that what one tablet will help you or what one injection. I think what we are trying to say is that there are multiple treatments available for multiple different headaches available. And as you can see, as Dr. Castellas said, there is a, a full society, international uh, headache society, which is looking at so many headaches. So it's difficult to advise on the chat box one tablet, but what we can uh, offer you is, is an, a proper diagnosis and taking ahead. As in your question, Sophia mentioning, I think uh, you have uh, other multiple pains available. So we can treat all the pains one by one. The other question is about uh, headache with neck pain. Again, uh, yes, migraine can uh, present on its own, but along with cervicogenic headaches, again, I, I would offer uh, a proper assessment and treating one pain one at a time and uh, decreasing the whole pain experience. That's what I would advise rather than give you one medication on the chat. Thank you. Yeah, well done. Um, and we like working with neurologists, so we don't work against or, uh, you know, in different corners. We like working with you or neurologists. So um, we have a number of neurologists that we've worked with for years and they understand what we can do and how we can support them. So by all means, get your neurologist, if uh, you have one, which I'm sure a lot of you do, to reach out to us directly as well and we can discuss things. Um, there's a there's a post from Emily. Uh, uh, nice to hear from you, Emily. Um, great to hear you're doing well with your occipital nerve stimulator. Um, as you know, uh, not the right treatment for everyone. There are ups and downs, but if we get it right or when we get it right, it can be uh, game changing. Uh, there's, a there's a question about how long does the pulse radio frequency last? Again, we would say approximately six months. Some people have had long uh, term success, some have had less, but give and take, we would say six months to 12 months is, is a very good number for uh, radio frequency procedures. Correct. And, um, and um, again, we've had some people who have got a year or two of pain control. So again, it's just about using these, these therapies sensibly uh, for, for the right pain. Uh, Crystal, uh, my son eight years gets frequent migraines, eye pain, sensory processing issues and motion sickness. Should we see a pediatrician or neurologist first? I've already consulted with a GP who's requested an eye test. That's a really good question. Uh, we see very infrequently, we see uh, children with, with chronic pain conditions. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, Crystal, whether it be a pediatrician or a neurologist. I think a pediatrician, probably, if, if I had to choose, because this is what they do, they manage kids. Neurologists may not treat um, a lot of kids. So if you're reaching out to a neurologist, make sure they they treat um, pediatric migraines. I think that would be that would be my recommendation for you. But you'll probably end up seeing both. Would you agree, Rajiv? I think uh, if you have pediatric neurologist available would be good, but let's let's start with the pediatrician first. Yeah, uh, that may be a good 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 choice. Correct, but because the pediatrician will have links to various uh, specialists that they have used over the years, so they might have links with a good neurologist that can help manage um, manage your son's problem. And I hope you get on top of it. Uh, there's a. Question in the chat, can treating masseter muscles, I think it's Millie. Uh, yes, uh, treatment of uh, muscle can help with TMJ pain. TMJ can itself cause uh, sore muscles. So definitely you are on the right lines. We, we would treat the muscle pain along with the joint as well. There's a question on top of it uh, from Leanne, uh, neck joint headache. Uh, do they increase with middle age? Well, we all uh, get arthritic changes in our joints as we get old. This is the price we pay for getting ourselves uh, known as an experienced person when we talk in front of anybody younger. So yes, you're right. With increasing age, arthritic changes happen and uh, neck pain leading to headaches can 
happen. But that doesn't mean you need to suffer with pain. Um, and that's what we pride ourselves on. So suffering, so, so pain is sometimes you might say inevitable, but suffering is not, absolutely not. Agreed. Uh, a very good treatment, uh, as Dr. Kistelis had mentioned, is available. We can burn the nerves which are going to the neck joints and it, it can uh, decrease or eliminate the suffering completely. Yeah. Okay, what else have we got? Uh, masseter muscles, yes, we've done that one. Neck pain, we've done that one. Uh, we have a question. Uh, I'm a physician. Wonder if problem may have an injury to his pituitary gland, uh, since his testosterone levels are extremely low. Neck injury is a 19 year old. Um, I can treat the cervicogenic component, but the cluster headache is quite different. Um, so that's this number one. This sounds like a complicated uh, condition. If you think there are issues with the pituitary gland or glandular problems, then a neurologist and or an endocrinologist would be a good starting point. Uh, in terms of the psychogenic component, uh, sorry, the, the cervicogenic component, um, uh, you can absolutely focus therapy with either good uh, physical therapy, some rehabilitation therapy, or we can diagnose and treat the joint pain with uh, nerve blocks and radio frequency frequency which can allow more movement and rehabilitation your question was on um uh but is botox of any use because of the headaches effects since tmj i'll give you my thoughts on botox and then rajiv will give you his um botox is generally used by neurologists for migraines and it can be uh, helpful but you end up having it every three months sometimes a little more than that uh, sorry sometimes three to four months um, I haven't found it to be that useful for that because I don't I don't think we generally see those kind of people however Botox can be very useful for various facial pain conditions and we've certainly got some people with little areas of pain where we apply Botox not on the nerve or the muscle but under the skin and that can be very helpful um, the issue with applying Botox on the face is sometimes you can get a little bit of asymmetry if you put it on one side and not the other side. Um, but I think in this complex case um, with pituitary gland issues, I don't know if Botox would be a good option in that situation. I think the key would be to see a neurologist and endocrinologist and make the diagnosis. What are your thoughts on Botox, Rajiv? Uh, uh, I think, Nick, uh, as you said, yes, uh, it can reduce the secondary muscle spasms and reduce the pain. There is evolving evidence about it working on neuropathic pain, again, in a similar way as we inject for migraines just under the skin. But the evidence is still uh, being collected. So I think it's still, uh, uh, the jury is still out for neuropathic pain. So for now, I would say, from uh, as you said, for uh, rehabilitation and relaxing the muscles would be the first choice for Botox in our hands. Okay. Uh, there is a question about how, uh, I think Sherry O'Connor, you're asking how uh, we can, uh, how much we can repeat the uh, pulse radio frequency. I think pulse radio frequency is not a treatment which kills the nerve, it only modulates the nerve. So repeating it every six months is absolutely safe procedure. So yes, uh, it can be repeated every six months. And sometimes uh, if uh, that fades away, we can consider neuromodulation on a long-term basis. But again, every case is different, but this is very safe procedure and can be repeated. Thank you. Uh, there is a question. Can you please give idea on what coping mechanisms can a pain specialist give? Uh, pain specialists do not work in a silo or do not give tablets or do not just give injections. We work with psychologists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, and we can help you how to cope with pain, initially with explaining what you suffer with, trying all the medication, taking help from uh, psychologists, re reducing the distress, and bringing normality back to life with help of uh, occupational therapists. So yes, you can come to Pain Specialists Australia and we can offer you all these uh, techniques under one roof. Thank you.
Coping is a really difficult one, isn't it? Because um, we all cope in different ways. And, uh, you know, sometimes people with pain cope with chemicals. So they just take tablets. And we've got to show people that there's not only uh, chemicals to help pain, sometimes simple distraction techniques, sometimes managing anxiety. Um, I was talking to a patient today um, and she was incredibly anxious. We did a telehealth consult, very anxious very distressed, little tearful, and you can see her sympathetic nervous system was up, not her parasympathetic nervous system. And one of the ways you can balance the nervous system or turn off those symptoms of anxiety is actually just to stop and take 10 slow, deep breaths. And that can really be an effective form of coping with the symptoms of anxiety. Again, it doesn't help for everyone, but it's all these little tips and tricks that you learn along the way. And once you kind of put them all together, then it can be very helpful. Um, so coping is a big part of what our OTs, physios, and psychologists can help people do. Uh, Nick, there's a question about CBD and uh, THC. I don't have experience of that. And uh, I, I wonder if you want to share your experience. Yeah, very good point. And a question that we hear a lot of, um, CBD is, um, uh, uh, cannabis oil with can can um, without the THC component CBD, THC is the stronger component. So you can have cannabis oil with CBD only, THC only, or a mixture of both. Um, if you have anything with THC, you can't drive. If you have anything with just CBD, it's probably not as strong, but you can drive. Now the evidence is not supportive of this therapy on the whole. Now, our faculty of pain has said, it doesn't work, don't do it, not until we've got studies. Um, but as a pain specialist, knowing on, in the real world, um, we don't have a lot of tools for some pains. We might have prescribed it on maybe 20 or 30 people, and it might have helped three uh, out of those 20 or 30 people. So the, this, that seems to reflect what the studies have shown. Now, we'll never say no to it per se, but other things should be trialed first. So it's, it's not as good as everyone says it's going to be or the, the, the big political drive to have it out there. It might be good for people that have got neurological disorders like multiple sclerosis or epilepsy and that are suffering immensely those with uh, um, you know, severe cancer and those kinds of therapies. But for chronic pain, we just don't have the data yet uh, to, to, to support widespread prescription of it. Um, perhaps it's going to happen in six months or a year. I don't know. Um, Emily asked a question about tension headache slide. Uh, I will go back to that. Um, and just for everyone's information, we hope that this is being recorded and will be put up on the Ramsey website so you can come back to this and, um, and have a look at it again. So I'll just share my screen. Um, a lot of pain conditions uh, have, let me, let me uh, take it this way. When, um, you should be able to see that slide when you're in pain, your muscle goes into protection mode or your body goes into protection mode. And what happens is everything locks down and that happens around the head. It happens around the back. That's what a lot of some of the back pain we treat is just a lot of muscle cramps in the back. Um, so have a look here on the top uh, uh, left, uh, pain within the masseter muscle in front of the masseter of pain within the masseter muscle can give you pain radiating down into the jaw and up even over the eye. So you've got to examine the masseter muscle and find a little point or two of pain um, that, triggers, um, that triggers your pain. Um, and again, there are many muscles and you can see uh, the trapezius muscle, which is a common area of tension. So the trapezius muscle above the shoulder, below the neck. And that can give you pain up and around the ear to the back of the eye. Uh, the temporalis muscle, which is the muscle above the ear, a very prominent muscle. Uh, and that's what's treated with Botox, um, with migraines. But of course, it can be a cause of pain with tension type headaches as well. So um, again, you need somebody that knows where these muscles are, how to examine these muscles, and how to find these trigger points so that we can, we can focus uh, therapies on them. Uh, there's a question about OxyContin. Uh, 
in the chat box. Uh, do you think, uh, I think it's Helen, uh, do you think uh, 15 milligram oxycontin affects cognitive control? Uh, and my, uh, this helps my son, but doctors don't want to prescribe this. Is this a government influence decision? I think, uh, Helen, uh, the question about opioids is very uh, uh, popular amongst uh, doctors at the minute. It's not just that they don't want to prescribe. Uh, the most important thing what we need to understand is that over time, opioids lose their benefit. And uh, the nervous system, which initially reacts to it, it stops reacting and uh, we then increase the dose and hence the patient gets into a loop of increasing the medication and especially I want to tie it in with the talk what just now uh, Nick said about uh, drug overuse and we know that medication overuse uh, headaches are quite known and opioids, oxycontin belongs to opioids are quite uh, known to be the culprit for it. Also, opioids on a long-term basis can become a cause of pain in whole of the body. There is a term called opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Now, these things are not uh, very commonly advertised. Uh, we know about the side effects of opioids, but pertaining to today's topic, it can cause headaches and a general body pain itself. And I think that would be the reason, especially for young people, doctors would like to keep them away from opioids. Hence, we can use other techniques or tricks, what Dr. Kistel has offered injections or neuromodulation to bring patients off opioids. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Yeah, and and the, the doctors are getting a bit of a push from the government because um, uh, the opioid accidental opioid overdose is a is a prominent uh, cause of death in in some patient populations so it's not the opioids by themselves but they're generally mixed with psychiatric medications um, sedative medications alcohol and uh, before you know it there's uh, um, uh, um, inadvertent uh, overdose and sometimes it can be fatal as well so Doctors and governments are very nervous about opioid prescribing. And the other reason is because there is no evidence that it works for the long term. We've seen a lot of patients that end up taking opioids because it kind of helps anxiety um, and people end up using it to take away anxiety. I might have told you the story before and I'll share it again. Uh, I remember one of, you know, 10, 10 years ago, a lady came into my clinic and said, um, I can't wait to get to the end of the day because I have a big glass of red wine and I take 20 milligrams of Oxycontin and all my troubles just disappear. And that's the wrong use of that medication. Um, uh, there's a question from Charlotte. Uh, she's asking, what classification would my headaches and migraines be when they are associated with increased pain in other parts of body? Uh, Charlotte, he, he, migraines uh, belong to headache family, and uh, when the migraines have been there for a long time, they sensitize the nervous system. When the nervous system is sensitized, it can cause pain in other parts of the body, and if you already have pain in other parts of the body, the pain can increase. So I would not like to look for a new diagnosis here. These are chronic migraines which have lasted for a long time and have sensitized your nervous system. That would be my opinion. Again, going back to the treatment cycle, then we have to see how we can optimally treat your migraine by using all what Dr. Kistelis had mentioned in his talk. So I would tie it to that, uh, please. Thank you. Excellent. Um, can venlafaxine cause headaches? Unfortunately, every medication can, can cause something. Um, so the answer is yes, it can. Venlafaxine is a... a a newer antidepressant that can help neuropathic pain. The only way to know if the head, this was a cause of your headaches is if it happened shortly after you started the venlafaxine uh, and if it goes away when you stop the venlafaxine. So I'm not telling you to stop the venlafaxine without talking to whoever prescribed it, but um, it, it, could, it could be a cause of the headaches, yes. Uh, Nick, there's a question from Tom Hammond regarding uh, C2 nerve compression by vertebral artery. I don't have experience of treating that uh, by injection therapy. Uh, do you? Um, I would be nervous about doing an injection on the C2 ganglion um, because if the vertebral artery is nearby, uh, there is a tiny risk that you could um, inject into the vertebral artery uh, and, and that is not safe. Um, 
So I would work closely with a, um, a neurosurgeon or a vascular surgeon. With uh, Dr. Kustelis, uh, I don't know if anybody can hear. Uh, Sharon, can you hear anyone? Um, I think uh, I think Nick's frozen. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe okay, I, I will take a couple, uh, couple of questions if you can message yeah. Nick. Yeah. Uh, Casey Simpson has asked, what's the main trigger of headache in the eyes area? Casey, there is no particular way to say why do you have pain in the eyes area. It may well be a, a combination of migraine. It, it could be a cluster headache. I think we need the diagnosis here. Yes, the region is right. It, we can have migraine or cluster headache or equally tension headache uh, also uh, showing up in the area of eye. Periocular pains can be there, but it's difficult to say what's the reason. Uh, okay, let me just see. Uh, there is an anonymous question about preventative advice for migraine. Again, it's a very big question. We can speak for half a day, but I think it's lifestyle changes, it's medication, and it's it's uh, looking after like how do we keep on aborting the attacks and using different medication or prophylaxis. So I think it'll be difficult to say it's the whole of uh, the talk. What Dr. Castellis has said, you can listen to it later on the websites. Uh, Nick, are you back? Can you hear me? Sorry, my PSA admin just disappeared. Yeah, it's back. <laughs> okay. What questions do we have? Uh, so does blood pressure trigger pain in old injuries? I think a uh, very important, Alistair, is that blood pressure uh, uh, can be a cause for a lot of headaches if it's not well controlled. So number one, control the blood pressure. If it goes out of control, it can be dangerous. It can be a cause of any cerebrovascular accidents, but can it trigger pain in old injuries? Uh, I think it's, it's difficult to say like that, what old injury we are talking about, it's not clear. But today, if you're talking about headaches, then yes, definitely uh, a, blood, a mismanaged or ill-managed blood pressure perhaps is not the best way. We have to manage that first and then treat the pain cause. Um, Charlotte has asked whether headaches and migraines can be associated with other parts of the body. Um, and uh, the answer is absolutely yes. So we see a lot of people with widespread body pain, which is called fibromyalgia. Um, and that can absolutely be associated with jaw pain, abdominal pain, headaches, and migraines as well. Uh, but again, it's important to make the correct diagnosis. So yes, headaches and migraines can be associated with widespread body pain. Uh, are there any vitamins or natural therapies uh, which help with pain management and reducing migraines? I Did think- you say uh, Natural therapies. Yes, yes. Okay, carry on. Uh, so uh, I think uh, migraine gets triggered with uh, lots of things, including stress, lack of sleep, inclu including uh, lack of uh, timely diet. Uh, so we have to have a very healthy lifestyle, adequate amount of water, adequate amount of sleep, avoiding nitrates, red wine, cheese. All these are very, very common things which are triggers. Now, talking about vitamins, there is no study that one vitamin will reduce the headache. But I would like to tell you that if you eat adequately proper diet, you will get all the vitamins anyways. So have a proper balanced diet. That would be the uh, most important thing. There is some evolving evidence about carbohydrates causing inflammation in the body. But again, this is not confirmed yet. People have tried to come off carbohydrates and reduce carbohydrates to decrease the irritability of the nervous system. I think you could uh, come to PSA and have a chat 
uh, with with a, a pain clinician, get a diagnosis and be referred to a dietitian. We have on-site uh, experienced dietitian who could help you manage uh, these expectations. So not a simple answer, but this is available and we can help you with that. Yeah, Sherry, our dietitian is uh, fantastic and we haven't had anyone that's gone to her and uh, not said it was a super experience and they've made some great changes to their diet and well-being. Uh, Nick, I think you were answering the C2 question and the voice uh, disappeared. So if you would like to uh, just give your thoughts on it, please. Yeah, so so I would be nervous about doing an injection around C2 if there was a big blood vessel there, because if you do an injection into the blood vessel, that can be really dangerous. So I would work with a neurosurgeon or a vascular surgeon to make sure that they have um, uh, released that impingement if they think it is a trigger for the pain. And once that impingement has been released, um, if the pain still persists and it was clear of a blood vessel, then we would definitely focus interventional therapies on that area. Uh, is there a pain management center in Sydney you can recommend, Nick? Uh, there are a lot of pain management centers in Sydney. Um, I, I don't think any one is better than the other um, uh, because we're not in Sydney. Um, but um, I think basically it would depend on geography, really. Um, I, think, I think that's the key thing is geography and availability. Just conscious of time. So we are about um, five minutes past eight. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight and for all the great questions that you've put through. We didn't get to all of them. Whichever questions didn't get answered today, we will follow up um, tonight's session with an email recording uh, as well as Nick and Rudy's contact information should you want to contact Pain Specialist Australia. Thank you again and um, enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks and sorry about those few technical glitches, everyone. Thank you. I think very interesting chat and questions. Thank you for all the questions and, and, and the uh, chat. Thanks very much, all. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks, Rajiv.